Here we go, man. My name is Lawrence Rosenberg, and this is the Alpha Human Podcast. Our guest today is Jason Van Camp. Jason is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he also played linebacker for the Army Black Knights football team. After graduating from West Point, Jason attended U.S. Army Ranger School and was later deployed with the 101st Airborne in the, in the invasion of Iraq. Jason would go on to become a Green Beret and a detachment commander with the 10th Special Forces Group. As a detachment commander, Jason led his team on close to 300 combat missions to kill, capture high value targets, as well as create and command one of the largest foreign internal defense forces in US history. Jason is also the founder of Mission 60, a leadership assessment and development company. And he is the author of Deliberate Discomfort, how US special operations forces overcome fear and dare to win by getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey man, thanks for that great introduction. I'm Honored to be here. This is going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, listen, it's it's my pleasure. I got to tell you, I, I've read Deliberate Discomfort. And um, it, there, it it, is. It, there it is. Well, I'll tell you what, this is an amazing book. And I, I highly recommend this because you've done something very different. You've, you've, ta you talk about a certain type of mindset. We'll get into that in a moment, but also so many lessons on high on on performance, team performance, individual performance, leadership. There's so much in this book, but the way it's told is unique because uh, it's told from the perspective of the people you meet uh, and who eventually you get a chance to work with, and later actually work with you after you leave the military it, with Mission 60. But what you do is you kind of get into their personal stories told from their perspective. Then you get into the science of what it is that they've experienced. And then you get into why it matters, why it's relevant. And then you get into with each of these experiences that your teammates describe, you get into how you've applied those lessons in real life with the companies that you train and the sports teams that you train. So I, I've just got, first and foremost, I just want to say phenomenal book. Man, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it means a lot to hear that because I poured a lot of my heart and soul into that book. It took me about a year uh, or sort of write it. And um, I just wanted it to be good, man. I didn't want to embarrass myself and I, I wanted to, uh, to make my team and those people that know me and, and stick up for me. I wanted to make them proud, you know? I'll tell you what, I, you know, just knowing the, the, the bona fides and the, 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 the backgrounds of the guys that tell their stories in this book, uh, I, I would feel just like you feel trying to live up to, you know, to even get the privilege to work with these guys. Um, I mean, you yourself have, have an amazing story as well, but um, let's, before we get into the book, just um, if you can give our audience just a little backgrounder on you. Uh, I mean, you, you were a Green Beret. Um, you, you were in the, the Special Forces, Army Special Forces for quite a while. Uh, you were a commander um, with the Green Berets of an ODA. I mean, what, first and foremost, what, tell us a little bit about your journey to getting into the Special Forces. What led you there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I started out in Virginia. That's where I'm from, right outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, it's a very patriotic area. You know, a lot of um, growing up, your friends, parents, at some level, worked for the government or were in the military. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your friends would leave, you know, be there for three years and then leave for three years and then come back. Or So there's a lot of transition. And and I grew up in that environment. So that was a very common, very normal thing. Uh, I didn't grow up wanting to be GI Joe necessarily. I didn't say, oh, I want to be a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret or whatever. I didn't really even say I, I would um, 
my lifelong ambition was to join the military. It was just something that I felt um, I needed to do. You know, I needed to serve. I needed to give back. I needed to um, help other people. You know, that's what excited me. And so I decided to go to West Point. My parents were excited because they didn't have to pay for college, you know, <laughs> and uh, I played football up there. Uh, we weren't necessarily a great football team when I was there, probably due to my own playing ability, you know, but uh, we were good one year and we went to a bowl game. Uh, I actually left West Point for two years after my sophomore year and I served a mission for my church, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I went to Russia. So I was in Russia for two years. Uh, basically as a teenager, I was 19 years old and, you know, got back when I was 21 and, uh, and I learned a lot, you know, opened, opened my mind to everything and I spoke fluent Russian when I got back and got a chance to see the world, see how other people operated and made decisions and, and lived. I finished my time at West Point. Um, everyone there is committed to a five-year uh, journey in the military. And I went to the artillery, you know, mainly because all of the West Point football players at the time, not all of them, but most of them went field artillery. And I just felt that that was my tribe. Those were my people, you know. And uh, within a couple of months of being in the regular army, you know, essentially during the officer basic course, 9-11 hit. And it changed my perspective and it changed, you know, our, our country's um, mindset quite a bit. And so next thing you know, we were uh, an army at war, you know, no longer a training army. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I deployed with the 101st Airborne Division to the initial invasion of Iraq. I spent a year in Korea. Um, I went to Ranger School. And right after I graduated, um, you know, well, not right after, but eventually I went to Special Forces Selection and Assessment and the Qualification Course to be a Green Beret. And I, I wanted to do it because... Uh, you know, I guess I didn't think that I ever wanted to be a ranger. And my buddy sort of convinced me to show up at 4 a.m. for pre-ranger training. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I showed up with a hundred and so other guys. And my buddy who convinced me to go wasn't one of those hundred guys. He didn't even show up, <laughs> you know? And so I was like, you son of a, you know what I mean? Like I was pissed, but I said, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm not going to quit. And so there was probably five, five, six months of pre-ranger training. So Monday through Friday, we had to get up at 4 a.m. and and just get our, our skulls crushed for two hours, you know? And at, at the last uh, physical training exercise in December, um, there were 12 guys left out of the 100. I was one of the 12. I was proud of that, you know? And 12 of us got accepted to go to ranger school. Nine of us made it. Mm -hmm. to go into ranger school and of the nine people that that actually went to ranger school only three of us graduated and i was one of those three and it proved it showed me that i'm more capable than i thought i was it showed me that i was able to accomplish hard things and do hard things and it became addictive it became infectious in a way and i, and I said to myself i want to keep pushing myself to see how far my limitations my boundaries are what can i accomplish and uh, sort of the same situation for the special forces um, tryout. A buddy mm -hmm. of mine convinced me to go with him. And, and I went and, and he didn't go. And when I was there, I fell in love with the whole thing. I, I, uh, I wasn't necessarily in, in love with the army, but when I got to the Green Berets, the special forces, I kind of fell in love with that. You know, they well, give you a lot more trust and you were, you know, autonomous to do things that you never dreamed of you were more highly trained and and um you were around a higher quality of people you know mm. of and, and that was really powerful for me you know so went through this selection process the qualification course loved every second of it it was awesome i excelled at it and i got um stationed at fort carson colorado with 10 special forces group and I was there for a short period of time, maybe just a month or two, two months, I think. And, and then I was off, uh, deployed to Iraq for my second deployment, first as a detachment commander. Right. And uh, it was a really rough rotation for us. We got back after nine months and uh, three months later, we we're again deployed to Iraq for another nine months. And um, 
at that time, my, my, my time as a detachment commander was up. So I got promoted to major and was sent to the group uh, AS3 shop, which is the uh, group S3 shop, which is the operations um, shop. And I was the assistant. So it was kind of a highly sought after position. Mm. And uh, it was cool. You know, I enjoyed that. But unfortunately, uh, due to some issues in, in combat and, and one of my last uh, rotations in, in Africa, uh, as part of it, um, during combined exchange training, I developed a seizure disorder. Okay. So I started having uh, tonic clonic seizures, epileptic seizures, and I couldn't kick it. And, uh, and eventually they, for a few years, I was seeing the top neurologist in Denver and North Carolina. And, and um, they told me that they had no choice but to medically retire me. And so wow. that was the end of my career after about 15 years. Well, I'll tell you what, that is a, um, a really, really um, kind of off-putting um, way to, to have to end uh, what was a, a brilliant career. Uh, and, to, you know, to, because, you know, clearly someone such as yourself uh, wasn't, wasn't going to leave uh, potentially of, of their own volition. Uh, and you know, you were, for, how did you feel about having to, having to leave? Did you feel like, you know what, um, this is, this is the, you know, this is your time. This is the right time to leave or were you, um, or were you really reticent about it? You know, I was probably pretty depressed, um, mainly because I didn't have control. It wasn't my choice. It was something mm -hmm. that was happening to me and I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, I felt like, you know, we do a lot of PT or physical training runs in the military, you know, every morning. Mm -hmm. And we turn the volume up on these runs sometimes to see how much you can take, right? And every now and again, you're not feeling it or it's too hard for you, you know, and, and there's going to be a fallout, you know. And I think I've fallen out of a run maybe once or twice in my entire career. And it's a terrible, terrible feeling, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, uh, it kind of felt like that was what was happening to me. Like, it felt like I fell out of the PT run. Like everybody else was running to the, to the end and I couldn't make it to the end. You know, and that's kind of how it felt to me. Um, but it was almost like I didn't choose that. Someone else kind of pulled me out of the run and told me to stop. Mm. And, um, you know, a lot of times you could argue that, but for this particular situation, I couldn't argue it. You know, I was, I was in a tough spot. You know, I was having multiple seizures a week. You know, it was, it was a, it's a crazy situation. And how are you now? Uh, I've got a good handle on it. Um, you know, the doctors weren't able to tell me why it was happening, nor were they able to stop the seizures. Um, you know, it's kind of crazy. They, they were going to cut a portion of my brain out to stop the seizures. You wow. know? And they couldn't tell me whether or not that that was going to make me a vegetable. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I think I'll handle it on my own. And so I, I've got some stuff that I do and some medicine that I take and everything. Every now and again, I'll have another seizure or whatever, but, um, you know, I've got it under control. Well, I'll tell you what, um, everything happens for a reason. Um, I believe that. Uh, and, you know, you've gone on really to do some incredible things with Mission Six Zero. You You somehow managed to get all of these great, teammates back around you working with you uh and you're you're working with some incredible organizations to pass on so much of the knowledge that you've accumulated uh the combined knowledge of some of these uh very powerful individuals and how what they've identified or uncovered and learned translate outside of special operations because you know special operations really holds for a lot of people this magical quality of, you know, because you guys are real life heroes to a lot of us. You are, you know, you are, um, you know, athletics, sports heroes are great, but, you know, it's a game. No one's life's on the line. You, you guys play the ultimate game. It's, it's life and death. And you're, and the, every time I read stories about your, your guys, the guys you, the guys you served with, or any of the special operations heroes or anyone in the military who were in combat, 
I, I hear over and over and over again how um, no one was afraid to lose their life in the moment. Obviously, it's, you know, everyone's fear is natural, but everyone seems to have been more afraid of letting their teammates down or, you know, losing their teammates. And that kind of self-sacrifice that, you, that comes almost within your DNA is, is really foreign um, in, in modern America. So, um, you know, you may have left, but you've got so much to give now. Uh, and I think a lot of us are very thankful for it. I'm, I got to read your book. And so, um, you know, let's get into that. Um, let's get into your book, man. Thanks, Lawrence. Let's do it, man. I appreciate all that. You know, how it works is this, man. There's, there's going to be a time when it's your time, whatever it is. If you play sports, there's going to be a time when you have to retire. You can no longer do that. Mm-hmm. You go in the military, there's going to be a time when you have to retire. You can no longer do that. And you're going to ask yourself the same question. Now what? What am I going to do with myself? And, and I chose to go an entrepreneurial route. And I started Mission Six Zero and Warrior Rising, you know, and I, and I wrote this book. And so let's talk about it, man. Let's get into it. All right. Um, so I, I got to tell you, the, so the book begins a couple of weeks after uh, you spent three years at the Special Forces Q course and uh, after officially becoming a Green Beret and the new commander right. of, the, of an ODA at Fort Carlson, Colorado. Uh, and you're at your, you know, the book opens up, you're kind of like at your initial meeting with your new boss, uh, the company commander, Major Brian Petit, who is a, a legend in the Special Forces community. Yep. Uh, and Major Petit asks you a few very powerful questions. And then he asks you to speak to a number of the leaders associated with the company, uh, officers, NCOs, and he, and he asks them to open up to you about their experiences on the battlefield. Uh, in order to help you become a more effective leader and to understand your people, your team, the, the, the guys you're working with. And the rest of the book goes on. Then all those conversations, or maybe most of those conversations that you had, those individuals tell, tell us exactly what they told you. And that's why this is an incredible book. But before we get into, because I want to talk about some of their experiences and what we learned from them. But um, Major Petit asked you some very interesting questions. Um, one of the questions he asked you was this. He said, he, he, he said, um, Jason, when you have nothing to think about, yeah. what do you think about? I mean, what, <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting interview question. I mean, what, <laughs> what was he getting out there? Yeah. So that's a powerful lesson that I've learned in my life. And, um, I really like the story too. It's, you know, who are you? You know, what do you think about when you don't have to think? Well, what does that mean? Mm. And, you know, I have a hard time. You got, I, did we freeze up? Yeah, it's okay. Good? Back. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, just let me know if it's uh, unstable or whatever. I'll, I'll go back and, and tell us. So, okay. Uh, and I don't want to correct you, but um, it's Major Brian Pettit. So it's Pettit is his last name. Pettit. So, okay, thank you. So now you know. Um, but but Brian's like, listen, you know, if I remember the story correctly, is there's a young man, he wants to be a physicist. His father was a physicist, right? And the young man figured he would just follow in his father's footsteps. And the young man is studying for an important exam, but he keeps going back to his father to ask his father questions. And finally, the father says one day, he gets frustrated and he's like, well, son, listen, we've been going over this a million times. You know, you're just not getting it. You're not picking this up. And you're a very smart, you know, young man, you know, you're you're incredibly intelligent and this should really make sense to you. Why doesn't it make sense? Haven't you been studying? Haven't you been working on it? Like, what's the problem? Mm. And the young man kind of, he feels bad about it and he kind of, you know, nods his head in shame and his father says you know when you walk down the street when you're in the shower when you don't have to think about anything else aren't you thinking about physics and the young man he just simply said honestly said he said no i I don't and his father says that you shouldn't be studying physics 
You have to do something and find something that you love so much that we don't have to think about anything else. We don't have to think about anything. That's what you think about. Mm. You know, and, and, you know, in the book, Major Pettit asked me this and he's like, well, what do you, what do you think about? And for him, he thought about the military and leading and being a commander. And that's why he chose the path that he did, because that's what he wanted to do. That's where his passion was. And, um, and it hit me really hard and made me think like, wow, what, what do I think about when I don't have to think? And, um, you know, I think we all should ask ourselves that question because if we would only have the courage to follow, to figure out what that is, identify what, what that is, and then follow that, I think we'd be much more happy and effective in life. It's incredible. Yeah, absolutely right. When I when I read that, I was like, wow, what a what what an incredible uh, question for self introspection and self awareness. Uh, but very powerful. He he also said something to you, um, which opens up a whole nother um, level of insight. So he said he said to you, he said there are good NCOs and bad NCOs. He said my advice is this: don't trust. <laughs> your NCOs, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you know, he said to you that, you know, he said, I believe in you. <laughs> even even yeah. though there was no evidence to suggest that you were worthy of, of his trust, you know, he still believed. So like, there's a bit of a dichotomy there. And I'm yeah. just kind of wondering, like, you know, what did he, what was that about? Like, what, you know, obviously I know I read the book, but for, for yeah. the benefit of our audience, you know, he's telling you, hey, you know, don't don't trust your COs. There's yeah. a difference, isn't there, between trust and belief? Can you can you elaborate on this? Yeah, no, that's that's personally one of my favorite lessons uh, from from Major Petta in in the book as well. And when you just hear that statement, don't trust your NCOs. Every NCO perks up and they get pissed off. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I'll be honest with you, how it works is, and I'll explain. You know, in the book. Major Pettit asked me, he's like, what are your top three leadership lessons, you know? And I said, okay, well, um, first I would say is um, whatever you do or fail to do as a, as a team is your responsibility. You know, we're talking about accountability. Mm -hmm. The second thing I said was, you know, officers eat last, meaning that you have to have, you have to care about your team. And one way to really truly authentically care about your team. And one way to show them that you care about them is to have them all eat first and you eat last. And oftentimes, you know, when you eat last, you don't get to eat because there's not enough, you know, MREs or T-Rats or whatever, you know. Um, but that's, you know, an authentic way of showing your team that, hey, listen, I put your needs above my own. I care about you. The team comes first. Mm. And the third thing I told Major Pettit from the three leadership lessons, I said, trust your NCOs. <laughs> and, um, and I said that because, you know, when I was a, a, a recently commissioned second lieutenant at what on the fields at West Point, you know, I'm asking all the officers and NCOs I can find like, Hey, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for me as a brand new butter bar? And in my experience, you know, to a man, every person I asked almost like a knee jerk reaction, they all said the same thing. Trust your NCOs, trust your NCOs, trust your NCOs. Wow. And I just did that in my career. I trusted my NCOs, you know? And uh, Major Pettit says, you know, trust your NCOs, huh? Well, how's that worked out for you? <laughs> and I thought about it for a second. I was like, huh, well, to be honest with you, sir, it hasn't worked out that great. You know, and he wasn't surprised. And he was like, well, tell me, you know? And 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 honestly, in my career, you know, I've I've, been honored to serve with the absolute best NCOs you could possibly imagine. Guys that you'd want in a trench with you, guys that performed in a firefight, guys that were the best of the best. You know, unfortunately, there were some guys that weren't the best. There were some guys that got arrested, that beat their wives, that got DUIs, that did a lot of things that were horrible, right? And, and I go even further. There were guys, you know, that I served with in combat that I want beside me on every mission but once we got back to the States, you know, some of these NCOs, I couldn't trust them to go out at night and not get drunk and get a DUI, to mm -hmm. not get into a fight at a bar. Guys that I could not trust to not cheat on their wives. Guys that I could not trust. 
and vice versa. There were some guys back in the rear that he, they could do any inventory. They show up right place, right time, right uniform. They were studs at PT. But then when we went to combat, they froze. They didn't perform. You know, right. they, they were afraid. They, they couldn't get the job done. And it wasn't that it was an NCO thing. It was, a, it, was a, it was an individual thing. It was a person thing. And so what Major Pettit is telling me is like, you know, you can't trust a person just because of their rank and their insignia because they have a couple of chevrons and rockers on their uniform. You have to get to know that person. You know, and once you get to know that person, you can learn through actionable trust building activities how far you can trust that person. And it goes vice versa. You have to get them to trust you. You have to show them that you're a person that they can trust. And he goes even further and he says, listen, in order to start the process of trust, and it's a long process and it's along a spectrum, you have to take that uncomfortable leap of faith and believe in someone first. And that's what it's all about is, you know, you have to say, you know, I don't know you. I know where you've been and I've done as much research as I possibly can about you. I'm going to believe in you and I want you to believe in me. You know, that's how we're going to start out. That's how we're going to start this foundation. Now let's learn how to trust each other. And here's how we're going to do that. I'm going to give you a task. I expect you to do it. Here's my task conditions, time, you know, standard. Um, and you're going to do the same thing with me. And once you do it, come back and report to me. And now we've moved up a notch on the trust spectrum. You know what I mean? Wow. And, um, and that's how he explained it to me. And when he did that, it, it really kind of changed my perspective because it was so unconventional and different than what I've heard previously in my career. And I couldn't help but just have that aha epiphany type moment of like, damn, he's, he's right. Mm. You know, trusting your NCOs, having someone tell you as a mentor to blindly trust your NCOs, that's horrible leadership advice, especially to a young second lieutenant, because you're going to get that kid into a lot of trouble if he's trusting the wrong NCOs, right? And it would be just as unconscionable and, and careless to tell brand new NCOs, trust your brand new second lieutenants or trust your officers. Same thing. You got to get to know the person before you can really trust. And, um, and belief, you know, trust is earned and given with belief and belief is how you start. Yes. And um, I, I just thought that was a powerful lesson I've taken with me, not only in my military career at that point, but also in my life. Yeah. I mean, that, it made so much sense because then, because I was, I was wondering, I mean, how do you move from, from belief to trust and what's that difference? But it, it, you know, Major Pettit really kind of um, brought it home that the proper evolution from belief to trust is accountability and follow through and what you've just described there. And that is, that is really so important. Um, yeah. it, it, and I want to get into now, because then, I mean, you guys talk about a bunch of other things, but I want to get into what you also learned in speaking with some of these other officers and, and NCOs at the company because, because he then sends you off and he's like, okay, now I want you to go and speak with, you know, a number of the other key players here. And, you know, I want you to, you know, I want you to come back and, you know, we'll talk about what you've learned. Uh, and so now the rest of the book is really about those stories. And one of them is from major uh, Steve Mueller. Yeah. Right. A, a U.S. Army special forces, Green Beret officer, uh, he also served as an Army Ranger in the 75th Ranger Regiment. And prior to that, he was a Navy SEAL. Yeah, he's a so, trifecta. He's got a PhD he's, in embracing the suck, man. He, um, I mean, that's unbelievable. Um, and, you know, kind of go into that in the, in, in the book uh, about how he pulled that off. But, you know, he kind of talked about something that I'd like you to help clarify, because this is almost like, there's, there's this um, incredible, you know, again, it's kind of like this thing, belief, trust, there's a lot of, you know, the, the, there's a lot of riddles um, in, in, in leadership, in, in learning how to, I mean, and I, I can understand that going into something as um, dangerous where life, you know, where life is on the line in the battlefield, nothing, you know, I don't know if everything's black and white, there's this, this fine line you guys walk. And there's this, 
this um, this conf I guess a set of conflicting priorities that uh, Captain Mueller kind of talks about. So the first thing, so he says to you, and I want to know how you wrestled with these following two um, issues. Okay. Quote. So number one is this. Mueller says the world teaches us to look after number one. Yeah. We're, we're wired for self-preservation uh, to think it's all about me. And he says, I need you to ask what's in it for the people on my team. Right. It's about the team. But. But he then goes into saying you're going to have to make tough decisions that may place the mission above your men's lives. And so he says, having this perspective, this mindset is not normal. No one wants to lose one of their men. Prioritizing the mission over the team is uncomfortable, but growth and improvement are uncomfortable things. Winning can be uncomfortable. So, you know, and, and then he goes back to saying, you know, but those are the guys busting their asses for you, trusting you with their lives. And that's got to be your why. That's why you exist. It's for them. It's if it's not for your men, then people are going to see right through you. So, <laughs> man, it's like. And, and I heard someone else kind of give me a quote, someone else who was in the, uh, the military and the FBI. And there's this I don't know if you've ever heard it before, but it's a quote that says. Um, Mission first soldiers always. And again, it's just this weird dichotomy. How do you wrestle with those two conflicting issues? Yeah, so I think when I was in the military, you kind of, you learn that stuff, but you don't really process it or, or kind of categorize it in that way. Or at least I haven't seen it put in that way until, you know, I, I wrote the book. And, and the way that it goes is, you know, mission is number one. The mission mm -hmm. comes first. You hear that a lot, but what does it, what does it mean exactly? Right. You know, you have to believe in the mission and, you know, the last uh, stanza of the Ranger Creed, you know, readily will I display the intestinal fortitude required to fight on to the Ranger objective and complete the mission, though I be the lone survivor. You know, that's the last stanza and that's always impacted me. And it means that you have to be determined and resourceful and loyal to the end. Your country is counting on you. You have to, you have to accomplish the mission. If you believe in that and you believe the mission can be accomplished and you mm -hmm. believe in the commander who's giving you this mission, you know, then you can articulate this mission set to your guys and have them buy in and understand that no matter what, this mission is going to be accomplished because that's what sets us apart as a military, you know, special operations, you know, we get the job done, you know, team is next. So mission, then team, you know, your team as a whole, how are you supporting them? How are you serving the team? How are you making the team better, you know, as an individual? Mm -hmm. Is the team culture okay? Is the team as an entity, is it surviving? Is it growing? Is it, is it in a good state? Third is the teammates, you know, each individual on the team. Are their needs being met? Are they valuable? Are they valued? Uh, are you communicating with them often, understanding what questions and concerns they have. Are you resolving those issues for them? And then uh, finally, number four, all the way at the bottom is, is self, it's, it's you, you know, and, and it's not a bad thing. You can't neglect yourself. You have to mm -hmm. look after yourself and make sure that you're, um, you know, you have everything you need in order to be a contributing member as a teammate to the team in order to accomplish the mission. And I think if you kind of categorize the priorities in that way, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to be successful, not only as a detachment commander or as a company commander, battalion commander, but also in business. You know, if you, if you prioritize that in business and have everybody on your, on, on your team and your company buy into that mindset, right. you're going to be successful. The only way that enigma works, right? And, you know, again, the mission first, team second, although, you know, it's all about your team, but nothing yeah. comes more, you know, the mission comes first. The only way that that 
riddle unravels is if what you just said, everyone has to buy into that mission. If, if, and if that trust isn't there, if that belief isn't there, if it's not with the right leader, I mean, God knows how many, you know, how many snafus can occur, you know, if that's the case. Um, or I shouldn't say snafus, maybe foobars are, are more likely in that yeah. instance. Um, so, there, okay. So an, another thing that you get into in the book um, is this, this uh, piece about um, self-determination theory. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and you know, you, you talk about um, in the book kind of this, you know, humans having this natural tendency to want to be motivated. And of course, you know, if you're going to be motivated to complete the mission when your life's on the line, this is this is so important. But I'm, a, a quote from the book uh, is this. If you want employees, because this is how it translates, right? So if you want employees who are fully and deeply committed to your organization's missions, goals, and values, and if you want employees that are happier, healthier, and more engaged, then the leader has to make sure three needs are met. Autonomy, some sense that one's behavior is freely chosen. Mm -hmm. Competence, the yep. feeling of mastery and growth. And relatedness, meaningful connections with others. Now, I, what I'm curious about is how do, you, how do you help a team meet those needs? How do you help them right, have that autonomy, have that competence, and be able to connect with each other. How, how does, you know, how does that work? Yeah. I love self-determination theory. It's, it was also an aha kind of epiphany type moment for me when I, when I learned about this, because what it says is by and large rewards and punishments don't work. You know, and, and when I first heard that, I was like, they work. Like, how does it not work? Well, they work to an extent, but what, what we're trying to say is, that in order for you to get to the level that we're trying to get you to, it has to be internalized, right? And this is how you do it. Like with those three things you said, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So autonomy, everyone has to believe that they have a choice. And I say this all the time, choose hard things or hard things are going to choose you. Hard things are coming mm. anyway. 2020 came anyway. You didn't have a choice in it. You might as well accept it. You might as well be proactive. You might as well do hard things before the hard things show up at your doorstep. Wow. And really what it comes down to is autonomy. It's, it's convincing yourself that you have a choice. It's powerful. And competence, you have to have a challenging task for your guys. You can't, it can't be something easy and it can't be too hard. You have to match the skill level with, you know, the, the task. Okay. Right. And it has to be something, you know, we can't say, Hey, we made $500,000 last year as a company. Next year, we're going for 50 million. It's like, <laughs> well, that's a bridge too far, you know, but if we're going to double it and we're going to go for a million or a million point five, it's challenging. And I want to, I think I can do that. I know what I need to do to get there. Um, and then relatedness, you have to show empathy. You know, you have to, and that's really hard to do as a commander sometimes because it requires you to listen and take a moment to not be so focused and hard charging and determined to, to accomplish the mission because you do, but you have to take moments to show empathy and to show that you understand where that person is coming from, that you understand their pain and you want to connect with them on a very deep and meaningful um, level, right? And I think if you can do that as a, as a leader, you know, you can instill that, that and have people internalize that mission, that, that message that you're trying to get them to buy into. Yeah, I, I was fascinated by what you wrote about self-determination theory, because as soon as I read, avoid the use of extrinsic uh, extrinsic rewards and punishments. Yep. Uh, forget about the punishments part. The rewards part kind of blows your mind a little bit because when you come from the world of business, yeah. Uh, and I've led sales teams for the past twenty five years, right? So that's that's my world. And you know, you, you're right. In the end, you are correct. But it's so hard to wrap your head around, and for companies to wrap their head around 
it's actually not about the rewards. And yeah. that's how most organizations um, look to um, get your dedication, your, you know, your commitment to, to get your motivation. They look to buy your motivation with rewards. And of course, we think that's what we want, but you're right. That's not what we want. What you, what you talk about in the book, thinking that you have autonomy, right? Um, having a role that, you know, your competence is respected in um, and being able to connect with others on a deeper level uh, to accomplish a mission. You know, if you can actually find a role like that in a, in a company like that and be a part of something like that, man, the money, all the other stuff just comes. No question. No question. And it comes down to me having a, a deep, meaningful conversation with you and saying, what are your goals? What do you want to accomplish, Lawrence? Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? And, you know, oftentimes when we have that conversation, you won't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Well, think about it. You know, really deep dive and think about what do you, why are you here? What are you doing? What do you want to accomplish? How can I help you accomplish your goals? You know, by the way, if you help me accomplish my goals, I'm going to mm-hmm. help you accomplish yours. And this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, that, that's what Major, uh, Major Steve uh, Mueller said, said to you when you raised, like, why are you here? Where are you going? How are you going to get there? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but, you know, um, one other thing um, you so hold on a second. This. Yeah. Um, I was looking for it here. This was this was something I really wanted you to elaborate on. Okay. You say in the book. The secret to the elite mindset of special operations forces. I love the setup here. That's such a powerful thing. The secret to the elite mindset of special operations forces. No matter how many books you read or podcasts you listen to is to look up. What is the look up mindset? I love that you asked me that. And, you know, I think... To be honest with you, chapter two is probably my favorite chapter in the book. Um, mm. And I, I, I've done the research and it's not anybody else's favorite chapter in the book, but that's okay. Um, but it's, it's one of mine. It is mine. And I love all the chapters. I'm not saying that. What, what I'm saying is the lessons here are the lessons that have really impacted me in my life. You know, And I tell a story about going to selection. Okay. First day, getting off the bus and doing log PT, log physical training, meaning you get into a small team Mm -hmm. of of new, you know, uh, candidates, special forces candidates, and and you hold a 300 pound, 400 pound log over your head, you know, for as long as you can, you um, do inverted push-ups, you relay races, you do bicep curls with it, you move it from one shoulder to the next, and you do this for hours. And there's a reason why the instructors do this is they wanna see um, who you really are. They want to see your character come out. When the stress increases, the pressure's on, and you're physically exhausted and you're tired, you can't fake it any longer. Your true personality comes out. Right. You know. And uh, you know, when we first start, you got the cheerleader types that are rah rah and they're excited, and they're talking, and you got the, you know, all these people talking and some talking trash or whatever. And and after about 20 minutes, nobody's talking, man. Okay. Everyone shuts up. And you don't hear really anything except for the instructors yelling at you, guys breathing hard, guys puking. You know what I mean? Like, that's what you hear. And after about an hour or so of this, you know, and with, as, as you're doing this, really, you're, you're saying to yourself, what did I get myself into? Why am I here? And, you know, you're saying, I've got to conserve as much energy as possible for myself. You know, you don't want to expend any energy outward. You want to put it all inside so you can survive Mm -hmm. and get through this. And for whatever reason, while we were holding these logs, even though it um, used energy that didn't internally affect me and help me, you know, I decided to expend my energy outwardly. And I looked up, I lifted my head and I looked around and I looked at my team. I looked at the teams next to me each of these other teams carrying logs, everyone looked just as miserable as I was, if not worse. And I saw a guy I recognized from, from college who was on a team. Mm-hmm. His name was Pat. And he lifted his head up as well. We both kind of made eye contact, you know, and, 
And uh, we just kind of smirked and laughed a little bit. Like, this sucks, man. Like, what are we doing? Like, you know, and uh, he just kind of shot it. He said, let's go, Jay, you got this. And, you know, I had no choice but to, you know, reciprocate, you know. You know, I shot words of encouragement back at Pat, you know, and then all of a sudden that inspired other guys to look up. And so a few other guys looked up and looked at me and looked at Pat. And we we're just kind of looking around. And all of a sudden we were kind of shouting words of encouragement at each other. And as we were doing this, it was interesting to me because I realized that time seemed to move faster, you know, and the log felt lighter mm. and I didn't really focus on my pain any longer. I was focusing on helping these other guys succeed and win. And when I did that, I, I realized that that was the whole point of, of log PT to realize that you're not alone. You know, you're, you're on a team and the success of the team is more important than your own individual success. Now, not everybody lifted their heads up. You know, most guys didn't. Mm. you know, and then there were guys quit, you know, during this whole situation, this whole like first day deal. And, um, and I realized, you know, flash forward a couple of years later, we were graduating from the Q course and I was in formation. We we're about to don our green berets. We had our green berets in our front right pocket, you know, and big celebratory event. And I, for whatever reason, looked up again and I looked around me and I saw guys, to my left and to my right, to my front, to my rear. And I, and I had this other epiphany. I was like, wow, all these guys that I'm standing in formation with about to don our green brace for the first time that have made it through this two, two year, two and a half year, three year course. All these guys are the same guys that looked up on day one. Wow. You know, and that's the secret. And I say in the book, man, it's, it's no matter how many books you read or podcasts you listen to, you realize that it's not about you. It's about the guy to your left and to your right. You know, and if you put forth all of your effort and your energy to helping that person succeed, you're going to succeed as well. You know, and, it, and I and I say in the book, it, it just doesn't apply to physical stress and special forces. It applies to everyday life. You know, you know, I go to church and this is the book. I'll just I don't know if you want me to get into that, but I go to church every Sunday, you know, with my wife, and my kids. And when my daughter was very young. We would get dressed up, we'd get her dressed up, we'd go to church, and then we sit in the, you know, um, in the pews. And, mm -hmm. you know, like clockwork, my daughter would start crying and she would make a racket. And, you know, being a sensible parent, we would remove her from the situation. We'd go sit in the foyer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we sit in the foyer and we try to calm her down. We'd try to get her to play with something. We'd let her kind of run, you know, in the, in the, in the, uh, the hallway a little bit and just kind of, calm down, try to go back inside and we'd be able to sit down for another 10 minutes or something. And then we'd have to come back out into the foyer. And um, after a few months of this, my wife and I just were exhausted. We just kind of looked at each other we're like, what are we doing? Mm. Like, why are we, why are we going to church? Like we get dressed up. We got to get up early. We got to put a suit and tie on and a dress on. We got to get our daughter dressed up. We, we come here. We don't hear the sermon. Mm -hmm. We don't go to Sunday school to hear the lessons. We just sit in the foyer and we try to distract our daughter. What's the point? What are we doing here? And when I was talking to my wife about this and frustration and she was frustrated, I was embarrassed because I remembered, you know, my experiences in the military, specifically log PT from years ago, you know, and I, and I realized it's not about me. It's about the people to my left and to my right at church. I'm here for them. I'm here to serve them. I'm, they're not here. They're not there to serve me. You know what I mean? And so I realized that even if I'm sitting with my daughter and my wife in the, in the foyer doing nothing, I can serve in some small way. Mm. I can say hello. I can open a door. I can give somebody a smile. And that's why I'm there. Not for my own benefit, but for service to help someone else. And I think if we apply that mindset in life as, as individuals, even though it's counterintuitive in a way, Right. I think we'd have a much happier, successful life. Yeah, you're uh, you're right. You, you you mentioned that story in the book as well. And, um, you know, again, there's there's so much in this book that's counterintuitive to the way we live our lives today. 
um, yeah. that if we if we did get uncomfortable because getting uncomfortable <laughs> is you know it, it's it's not something we naturally want to do. It's counterintuitive, right? It's counterintuitive to get to put yourself in an uncomfortable position. That's yeah. not we want the body, the mind wants homeostasis. We don't we don't want anything that's going to disturb you know that status quo. But um, you know, that comfort zone gets us nowhere and, um, you know, we're all probably too comfortable. So uh, more, that's very powerful. Um, I want to jump to Joe Cerna. Oh man. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, uh, retired now U S army special forces, green beret NCO, uh, yeah. earned a bronze star, um, two additional bronze stars, two purple hearts, um, yeah three combat rotations in the Middle East, but it's the story that he tells uh, near death struggle. Um, th this, this uh, experience that he had that he relates to you, my God. Um, so, so it's, it's in the chapter called fog of war. Yeah. And his life and near death struggle as the vehicle that he and his men were in, he tells a story about how they crashed into an aqueduct and he was, he was faced with this fog of war moment where the kind of like the overwhelming nature of the chaotic circumstances, those uh, VUCA, right? Volatile. What is that? VUCA volatile, uncertain, complex, uh, and ambiguous, ambiguous circumstances, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, it, it consumed him and his men and ma namely because um, initially he was, he, you know, he was unable to get free of his harness while the vehicle starts sinking and taking on water. He can't get out of that, that harness and the inability to escape and avoid drowning kind of leads to a feeling of loss of control, helplessness, panic. Yeah. Yet in numerous instances, he chose to take control of what would happen to him. And it's really, there's like, there's like a number of moments while this is all happening as like, it's almost like a movie. I mean, the, the water starts coming up to the last inch of the vehicle. He's sucking what air he can. One of his guys is, is already down uh, underneath the water and, you know, out. And, you know, he keeps taking control of di different elements of that situation. I don't want to give away the story because it's so powerful. Um, but, you know, how does I, one of the things that you talk about is how emotional intelligence helps in instances like this. And um, how it it helps in the uncertainty of chaotic environments, and I, I kind of wanted to I, I want you to I want you to get into why that is, but also there's this concept that you talk about called the locus of control. Locus of control. What is this, and and why is it significant? Yeah. So, so Joe's. The chapter with Joe Stern, chapter five, is according to market research, is probably everyone's favorite chapter, and it's wow. a powerful one. Yeah, you know, and Joe, um, you know, like you said, he's in his RG thirty one up armored truck that you know um, falls into an aqueduct and is overturned, and all the electrical went out, and you know, water's rising higher and higher and higher. You know, it's it's as uncomfortable and stressful a situation as you can imagine. You know, trying to get out, you know, time's running out, you don't know what to do. And, you know, you got to make a choice. And Joe, at one point, he said, I'm going to die. And he put a gun to his head. Mm -hmm. I don't want to drown. You know, and then he thought about his family. You know, he thought about his kids and he thought, you know, how much he loves life. And he thought, you know, I, I don't want to do this. And he makes a choice. You know, it was his decision. I'm not going to drown. You know, he changed his mind. He decided to concede to a higher being. And this choice, you know, this decision is, is your locus of control. And Dr. Sarah Spradlin one of, the, one of the amazing scientists and veterans on the Mission Six Zero team, she coined the locus of control phrase. That's her, her thing. And it's obviously a powerful thing. You know, when your emotions start to get the better of you and they ignite mm -hmm. and decisions are made and actions are taken, 
you start to see different perspectives. And as humans, you know, it's very easy for us to self-justify. So we instantly begin to categorize our thoughts and our decisions and our actions as either, you know, this is a success or this is a failure. And in doing so, we attribute uh, success and failure to either of those things we have control over, right? Or to those external forces outside of our scope of influence. So the position we choose is called, with Dr. Sarah Spradlin, it's called the locus of control. So imagine, um, you know, a lazy Susan, right? Mm -hmm. And if you maintain a position that outcomes are derived from your own thoughts, actions, and decisions, you believe that you maintain full control of your own success and failure. You maintain what is called an internal locus of control. And an external locus of control is when you feel like you have little to no scope of influence over your own success or failure. And that's um, as though you're an actor in a movie that's your own life, Mm. you know? So what we ask folks is, you know, where do you fall along the spectrum of your locus of control? You know, what's your dominant position, you know? And, and once you understand that and where you want to be, you know, if you have an internal or an external locus of control, um, we can help you kind of by understanding yourself and becoming self-aware of this, mm-hmm. understanding your emotional intelligence, because ultimately we believe that locus control is a component of emotional intelligence. Uh, we can help you identify, accept, adapt, and effectively manage situations better that you simply cannot influence. You know, uh, we tell people all the time, you know, control what you can control. And if it's outside of your control, don't put happiness in someone else's hands, you know, control your own happiness. And that's what the locus of control is, is kind of all about. Yeah. Um, it, it's so powerful because, you know, he, uh, Joe Sarna was in a situation that was out of his control out of his control, what was happening to him, you know, uh, again, apparently was out of his control. And, you know, what, what ends up happening to him, he ends up not having control over, but yet he figured out how to exert control in smaller ways throughout that experience in a, in a number of ways. So again, another enigma, how to, how to find your locus of control in, in, in uh, in situations where you have no control. (laughs) Uh, you know, these, that's why these are powerful lessons. Um, yeah, no, no uh, doubt. When you're in situations like that, that are out of your control, there are certain things in that situation that you can control, you know, and, and Sarah says it, Dr. Spradlin says it all the time is, you know, this lazy Susan approach is, you know, like that, that wheel that you have condiments on and salt and, sh- and, and pepper mm-hmm. and so forth. Just move it to a different perspective, show that empathy and see it from someone else's point of view or the situation's point of view. And that mindset can help you um, with that perspective and, and to make better decisions and understand um, how to better control your emotions. Yeah. Um, I, there's so many other um, lessons in this book from these great stories. I want to hit you with one more story. Sure. Um, and that's from Master Sergeant Leroy Petrie. Yeah, Petrie, Petrie. Petrie. Yeah. Petrie, right? Yeah, um, uh, I got to learn to pronounce these names correctly. No, no, it's 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 hard, man. I, I made Petrie. those same mistakes when I first met these guys too, you know. <laughs> so here's a you know, Master Sergeant, right? Fifteen years active duty uh, service with the 75th Ranger Regiment. Yep. He he earned the Medal of Honor for his actions uh, during combat in Afghanistan. And, you know, he, this chapter is kind of about spirit um, because the, another incredible story, right? Because he, he loses his hand. Uh, so, so he's in this incident where um, he, he's, in a, he's in a courtyard um, with his guys and Things, you know, start to go, um, you know, tarfu, things get really, you know, messed up quickly, right? Yeah. They start, people, you know, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the, the enemy combatants start, they start throwing grenades out of nowhere. Yeah. And he sees, a, he sees a grenade on the floor. Now, he's, by the way, he's already been shot in, in the legs. 
twice. So, right. And and he's not even he's like, you know, he's not even thinking about stopping. He's still going. And he sees one of the grenades on the floor. And he looks at that grenade and he's like, man, that that doesn't, you know, that looks like a grenade from like the Vietnam War. He's yeah. like a pineapple yeah. grenade. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, like a pineapple. He's like, we don't have grenades like that. And he's like, oh shit, it's not one of ours. So he picks it up because he wants to clear it away from, from the guys. He wants to clear yeah. away from so he actually picks this thing up and goes to throw it. And just as it leaves its hand, his hand, it 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 goes off. And like he's knocked back. And then he, you know, he kind of like he doesn't get knocked out. And and you know, he looks at his arm and his hand's not there anymore. No. Right. So now he, you know, his hand's gone and most people, they'd be in shock. It's over right there. Right. But he looks at his arm with the kind of like the bone sticking out. And all he's wondering is like, how come the blood's not spurting out? So yeah, with, with his, and that's his good hand, right? His, his right hand. Right, yeah. He's right handed. So he yeah. He takes, he takes the other hand and, and he kind of, you know, gets a, you know, he, he gets a tourniquet and ties off, ties it off and yeah. gets right back into the fight. Yeah. And he gets his gun and, you know, in, with his other arm and he's, and he's helping his guys and he's in the fight until finally, you know, some of the guys, one of the medics, like, listen, you, you, you know, that's it. You gotta, that, you know, look, time to sit back. Let us take care of you now, because, you know, you're, you, you know, if you don't stop, you're gonna, you're gonna bleed out. You're gonna die. You know, you gotta stop. You shot in the legs, you lost your hand. And, and he's almost like, at, only at that point did he realize that, wow, okay, maybe I should stop, you know, because his spirit was still willing. And in the book, here's, here's what you say. Um, you say that he, you know, he was able to maintain control um, in these incredibly uh, volatile, again, VUCA circumstances, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous circumstances that he found himself in by tapping into the inner power of the human spirit to make what you said before, to make a choice. But that choice was based on his core beliefs of loyalty and determination to overcome overwhelmingly intense physical pain. His choices enabled him to interrupt the stress response, better known as fight, flight, or freeze, as he needed to continue the fight. Leroy's spirit empowered him to find comfort in discomfort to ignore the pain and fight on until his unit won the battle when others might have quit. Um, and then you say, recognizing and leveraging the power of your spirit can sharpen your focus and determination and can access the body's untapped potential to achieve truly exceptional feats. What I want to know is, how do you find or how does one develop that kind of spirit? It, it's different for everybody. You know, um, first thing we say is identify your values. What do you value as a human being? What's most important to you? And we have a bunch of values in the back of the book. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you, you identify all the values that, that really speak to you and it means something to you. And you kind of whittle them down and, and, and have the values compete against each other until you have about three, maybe at tops, five values that you okay. believe in. And you're like, this is, this is, these are my beliefs and this is what I believe in. And or these are my values and this is what I believe in. And this is, you know, the type of values that I'm going to use to make decisions as I go throughout my life. When I meet other people who share these same values, I um, relate to them. You know, we become friends, you know, we're on the same level. We have that foundation. And so values, first off, what do you value? Right. Because when you're in situations like this, your values really come out for Leroy. Like you said, Leroy is determined and he's loyal. So he was determined to win and to continue fighting. And he was loyal to his guys. He wasn't going to abandon them. He wasn't going to quit. He wasn't going to pass out from blood loss. You know what I mean? His spirit was able to overcome kind of in a superhuman type of way, you know, him being shot through both of his legs for hours at a time bleeding for him to pick up a grenade, have it detonate on his arm, losing his arm, calmly putting a tourniquet, you know, on his right arm, stopping the bleeding, picking up his weapon with his left hand, continue fighting, 
you know, his guys got shrapnel and were injured, taking care of them while he was fighting. You know, the first time his his sergeant came to him, he was like, Leroy, we got to get you out of here. That's right. He's like, no, I'm good. You know, like go take care of these other guys and come back for me later. So, you know, the guy was like, uh, okay, I believe you. Like, I'm looking in your eyes, Leroy. Like, I don't think you're good, but I'll be back in, you know, as soon as I can. Leroy defeats the Taliban, gets his guys to safety. And then finally, you know, like the, the sergeant comes back and gets him, you know, and then at that point is when he could relax and when he could say, okay, it's over. And that's when like he ba basically passed out, you know, because of everything that he did. And it was because of his power of spirit and his values, you know, kind of determined who he was and what he believed in and it kept him going when times were tough, mm. you know? And, um, you know, when we talk about spirituality and spiritual strength, we're not talking about religion. You know, we're talking about that untapped power of fortitude, the human spirit's foundation of optimal human performance. Um, and it, 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 it's how sometimes people can do superhuman things. It's because of their, their, their human spirit, their power of, of spirituality. You know, you, you've got a lot of these guys with you at Mission Six Zero now. You're teaching a lot of these lessons to, to businesses, to, to yeah. professional sports teams. And you say in the book that um, these companies and these teams, they often ask Mission Six Zero to help them succeed. Yeah. And they, you know, when, you know when, when you ask them what success looks like, they frequently struggle to quantify it. And you, you have found that success ultimately ha is defined as happiness. And, yeah. you say, and you say that happiness is the precursor to success, not the other way around. Yeah. And what I found really interesting is that, um, you know, and again, you've said this before, but it all comes full circle because you say that true happiness comes from serving other people, yeah. which again is what you talked about earlier. But then here's the part, once again, another enigma. Okay. How do you find <laughs> how do you find happiness and achieve success? This is what you say in the book. How do you find it? How do you find happiness and achieve success? You say, don't make it a goal. Yes. Okay. You got so explain, <laughs> explain, because everyone else, their goal is to be happy and become a success. And maybe yeah. it's in the other order. My goal is to become a success and then I'll be happy. But even if it was not in that order, if it's in the right order, which is my goal is to be happy, you're saying, no, don't make it a goal. Please explain. Yeah, it's a lot of the stuff that we have in deliberate discomfort is, is counterintuitive, you know? And uh, so it's like, if you want to be happy, you can't try <laughs> to be happy. You can't focus on being happy. Like, how does that work? And the, the quote that I use is, is a line taken directly out of um, a book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. Oh, wow. You know, and, and in that book, it's, um, it's incredibly powerful because um, he's uh, a Jew in Europe during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And he's, um, I, if I remember correctly, he was, he was a scientist. That was his, you know, he, he, that's what he did with his life. And he gets thrown into um, a concentration camp and he's there for, for quite a long time, I think a, a year or so. And he's seen all the things that, you know, the, the guards are doing to them and how they're losing their humanity and, and how some of his fellow prisoners are um, making decisions to keep themselves alive, but they're very questionable, unethical decisions they're, they're basically being um, disloyal and, you know, and, and that's one of the things that he says about happiness is you can't, you can't search for it. You have to let it, you can't pursue it. You must let it ensue or mm. it's not going to work for you. And uh, I want to find that, that exact quote uh, somewhere um, and read it to you exactly. If you can tell me what page that's on in the book, I'll, I'll read it to you because it's a powerful one. <clears throat> yeah. So let's see. Um, I will tell you because I have the, the book here. Um, <clears throat> I 
So it's on page um, 151. It says, how do you find it's on the trifecta of happiness? Um, and it says, how do you find happiness and achieve success? You don't make it a goal. The, mo the more you chase it, the less you will find it. Viktor Frankl explains brilliantly. There it is. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, so you I'll, have I'll it? the whole thing. Don't aim at it. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Happiness must happen. And the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscious commands you to do and to go on to carry it out to the best of your knowledge. Then you will live to see that in the long run, in the long run, I say success will follow you precisely because you had forgotten to think about it. It's powerful and it's wow. counterintuitive, you know, and, and this is a guy um, that lived through the Holocaust, the concentration camp, you know, he, he lived through seeing the worst of humanity, you know, and this is a guy that still believed in happiness and success. And a guy who said, you know what, you got to let it happen. You know, the more you chase it, the farther away it's going to be, you know, you have to lose yourself in service to others and only a life lived for others is a life lived worthwhile. And that's what I believe. I'll tell you what, Jason, I don't think we could end the podcast any better way than with what you just said. Uh, just an incredible experience um, reading this book uh, and seeing the world through your eyes and the, the eyes of the, uh, the heroes that you served with uh, and, that can, and that you continue to work with. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for, uh, for coming on the show. Where can our audience learn more about you about mission six zero and all the incredible things that that you work on oh man Lars, thank you so much for having me it's been a lot of fun i enjoyed it the uh the time just flew by you know thanks for doing the research and you know thanks for all of your your positive commentary about the book as well you know you can pick up a copy of deliberate discomfort on amazon uh it's a number one amazon bestseller we're really proud of that if you want to leave a review please leave a positive one you know, um, <laughs> absolutely. You you want, How could you, know, you I don't not? Wanna, I don't want to force you to do anything you don't want to do. But I also, if you go to deliberatediscomfort.com, I'm giving the book away for free. All you have to do is pay for shipping and handling. And um, we have a couple other things going on. One, we're going to launch something called the Deliberate Discomfort Challenge. We're launching okay. this on Saturday, and. Uh, we're going to start the, the challenge. It's a 60 day challenge on January 4th. Mm -hmm. And we're going to say um, for each of, each of the six domains that we have uh, at Mission Six Zero in our total warrior model or whole person model, um, what we're doing is mentally you read a book every single week. And the first book in the docket is the deliberate discomfort. Okay. Physically, you're going to work out in the gym for 60 minutes every single day. We give you the workout program. Also, you're going to work out outside to do some cardio 60 minutes every day. We're going to give you the cardio program. Also, you know, you have to eat, um, you know, a nutritious meal. So we're going to give you um, the option to get meals delivered to your home after speaking one-on-one -on -one with a nutritionist, prepared meals, you know, customized to you, delivered to your home. Mm-hmm. Spiritually, John McCaskill, who's a Navy SEAL on my team, he created a mindfulness uh, exercise. So every day you're going to listen to some mindfulness uh, practice and, and do it. Uh, socially, you know, we ask you to reconnect with someone, family member, a friend, a, somebody who used to be a friend, somebody who you had a falling out with. We ask you to reconnect with somebody every single day, wow. uh, 60 days and have a meaningful conversation with that person. Emotionally, we give you a gratitude journal and you have to write a page in your gratitude journal every single day, something you're grateful for. Um, and then professionally, 
We're going to give you our Deliberate Discomfort Masterclass, 66 videos. It's our entire team, veterans and scientists alike, going through each chapter, discussing the themes and so forth. And, um, and you watch one of our videos. It's a 15-minute video. You watch one of those videos every single day. And then you post on your social media platform of choice something from Deliberate Discomfort Challenge that impacted you that day. So we're starting that you know, on January 4th and people can sign up for it as early as December 4th. And I think it's going to be a great um, way to choose hard things in 2021. You know, everyone's complaining about 2020 yep, and how hard of a, a year it was. Well, you know what? 2021 is also going to be difficult. You know, so we might as well be proactive and get ahead of the game, you know, and, and make it a choice. And, uh, and we're really excited about that. So, so the book Deliberate discomfort.com deliberate discomfort um, challenges is, is also found there. You can go to mission six zero.com to find out more about my team and what we do as a business. And i um, sorry for being so long winded Lawrence, but that's what we got brother. So thanks for having me on. No, man. I love it. I love it. I, let me tell you something. I had, you know, uh, probably two more hours worth of questions. So, um, you know, all, all of this that you're, that you're giving us here, uh, and, um, you know, so graciously spending your time with us. I know you got other things planned that you got to do right now. So I really appreciate you taking uh, this time to spend with our audience and really kind of giving us this incredible insight. Uh, and, you know, the, just the, the counterintuitive nature of what has led you in your life and the lives of so many of the the leaders that you've worked with to find happiness, success, and to just have survived or lived through things that most people would have not lived through or would have quit. There's so many more incredible stories in this book. I implore everyone listening, you got to buy this book. I mean, just for the stories alone, what you will get out of that, it's going to impact your life. But for the lessons as you explain them and how to use them, that's next level. So thank you so much, Jason, for being on the Alpha Human Podcast. And yeah, Godspeed, brother. Love it. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you.